Good morning. Everybody having a good summer? I think the people in first service are a little more happy about summer than you. Glad you woke up and made it here today. We are in a parenting series. We're in part three of a five-part series. And we're talking about bringing out the best in our kids and how to pass on our faith and values to the next generation. And this is not just for parents and not just for grandparents. It's for all of us. The subtitle is, It Takes a Village. And that is true of a church, too. It takes, it takes a community, all of us together, to pass on these values to the next generation. If uh, you have that outline that's in your program and you pull it out, you'll notice on this side, there's five key words with a little verse from Timothy. And the words are confidence, character, convictions, competence, and compassion. And I think we would all agree this, these are characteristics that all of us want to be strong and healthy in our lives. And these are values we want to pass on to our kids. So today we're on convictions. The convictions grow out of our core values. And they are things that we, we live for, and sometimes they're so strong that we would even die for them. That's, that's what convictions are. Now, instilling values in the next generation is a challenge. I think we would all agree. And one of the reasons is because we live in a culture where, by and large, there is um, a cultural um, conflict with God's word and there's this sucking into a mold that is contrary to God's principles and really it's going to happen to all of us unless we figure out how to resist conformity to the culture around us. That's why this verse is so important. It's, it's Romans chapter 12 verse 1 and 2 and part of it says this, <clears throat> do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, every one of us will be conformed to what the culture around us unless we're intentional about being transformed by the renewing of our mind through God's word, through God's spirit. But this is, this is difficult because our kids are not growing up in a value neutral, or they are growing up in a value neutral world. And, and our society is constantly bombarding us all with messages that are just the opposite of God's plan for his children. We can make a long list of these. Let's consider just three. These are messages of our society contrary to God's word. Number one, sexual purity is boring. You turn on any movie, and just about every movie, you get the idea that sleeping around all the time and one night stands, that's normal. That's, not, that's what the cool people do. And if someone has uh, values and boundaries and morals and and standards when it comes to sexual purity, then that's, that's weird. That, that makes you, you know, a nerd or a loser, uh, you know, a misfit. And, and, you're, and certainly your life is going to be boring if you live that way. And, and what's sad is the opposite is true. God's principles are not about restriction. They're about freedom. God knows what he's talking about, and he wants a good life for you. And so, you know, think about sexual purity gives kids four things. It gives them freedom from guilt and shame. It gives them freedom from ruined relationships and an ability to trust. It gives them freedom from a bad reputation. And it gives them freedom to build future intimacy in relationships. That's the truth. God's principles bring freedom. But our kids are growing up in a culture that's screaming something different. And it's saying sexual purity is boring. This is such an important topic for all of us. We're going to come back to this in September. We're going to do a short series on sex in a broken world and, and God's plan. A second cultural message is that material possessions are what bring you fulfillment. And again, we get bombarded with this idea from every direction, especially if you watch any kind of advertising or commercials. Here's just one example. Watch this. You wake up in your luxury bed and slide out of your luxury sheets. You get into your luxury shower and dry off with your luxury towel. You put on your luxury suit and your luxury watch. You grab your luxury coffee from your luxury coffee maker and add some luxury sugar. You step out of your luxury house and step into your luxury car. Which makes everything else seem ordinary. Introducing the Acura RLX. With jewel eye LED headlights and precision all-wheel steering. It's luxury taken to a whole new level. Now, there's nothing wrong with luxury if you can afford it. 
But the message that I'm hearing from that commercial is that if you drive this new Acra, you're going to find fulfillment that you would never know without it. And this is the kind of message that we just get bombarded with over and over again. And it's not true. We've all been tempted to believe it. I have. But, but everything that we purchase loses its appeal over time. And uh, that's, that's the truth about idols, by the way. They never deliver what they promise, even though they can be, oh, so enticing. A third message that our kids and all of us are getting from culture is that life is meant to be lived for self-gratification. It's all about me. In the last decade, uh, the rapper Drake made popular the acronym YOLO, Y-O-L-O. And if you're under 25, you probably don't know what it is. But it's, it stands for you only live once. And so it started popping up YOLO and music and youth culture and hashtags and graffiti and tattoos and merchandise. YOLO showed up everywhere. The idea is contrary to the truth. It's this, that, that you only have this life, period. So you better pack it as full of pleasure and gratification as you can because it's all about you. And that's what life is about. Now, that is, again, the opposite of the truth. And so all our, not just our kids, but all of us are, are going to buy into these shallow lies if we don't consciously and regularly deconstruct them and replace them with biblical truth. And so this is so important. There's this problem that we're up against, but let's not camp out there. Let's move to the prescription. Let's move to what it looks like to parent in a way that changes lives. One of the best chapters in all the Bible that I've found on parenting and on passing on our values to the next generation is a place you might not think. It's the fifth book of the Bible. It is way back in Deuteronomy chapter six. I, I would encourage you to read the whole chapter and look for principles here for passing on values to the next generation. We're just gonna read the first eight verses. And this is right after God led his, the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage supernaturally, miraculously, and to Mount Sinai, and he gave, him, they gave, he gave them the law. And then he says this, chapter 6 through Moses, verse 1. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. Now watch this. So that, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. Jesus later picks that up in the new covenant and makes that the primary law of the new covenant. He goes on to say, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. That's where it starts. We get God's purpose, God's word on our heart. And then what? Verse seven, impress them on your children. That's our responsibility collectively to somehow pass these values to our kids, the God's word. Impress them on your children. How are you gonna do that? Not just formally, like sitting down and giving them a lecture, but in the course of everyday life. Watch this. It says, talk about them. When? When you sit at home. When you walk along the road. When you lie down. When you get up. In the course of everyday life, find ways to work these values that you want to communicate into your conversation with your kids. And then it says, this is interesting, verse 8. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. That sounds weird. What's that mean? Well, well, in the Bible, hands many times are a symbol of action, of work. And, of course, the forehead is a symbol of thinking. And so God's saying, impress my truths on your kids in such a way that it is in their thoughts and it is in their actions. They not only believe it, they live it out. And, and I want you to do that as well, but I want you to pass it on to your kids. And if you keep reading, the whole chapter is great. It gets down to verse 20 and it says, in the future... We need to be thinking about the future when we're parenting. It says, in the future, when your son asks you, what is the meaning of the stipulation, decrees, and laws of the Lord our God has given you? Tell him, go ask your mom. 
<laughs> no, it doesn't say that. It says, you tell him. You be ready. When he asks you, why do we believe this way? Why do we do these things? Why do we follow these teachings? You tell them. And then he goes on to tell them the story of the Exodus. We were slaves in Egypt, and God, through his mighty hand, delivered us. Now, again, this is the old covenant. We live now in the new covenant. And the way we would do this now is if our kids come to us and say, why do you believe? We would tell them not only the story of the Exodus, but we would tell them the ultimate story that that pointed forward to. That was a signpost for the ultimate story, which was the deliverance from slavery that happened at the cross through the death of Jesus and at the tomb through his resurrection. And we as parents got to be able to tell that to our children because we want to impress on them these values so that it will continue one generation to the next, not just our kids, but our grandkids and their kids. So there are, there are three principles for parenting that we can take out of this passage. We're gonna talk about values, variety, and vision. First, values. If you write this down, think of core values as, as what is worth living and worth communicating. You see, if you, if you are only communicating values and not living them, it will not help your kids. But if you're living them out and communicating them, it's going to make a difference. Deuteronomy 6 verse 1 says, These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land. So there's observing and teaching are both a part of passing on our values. We've got to learn what God's word says and then model and teach it to our kids. Chances are they are not going to learn it on their own. They need us. They need you as a parent. They need the church. They need other believers that you're friends with. They, it takes a village, and it takes a church. Today, we are living increasingly in a biblically illiterate society. Just um, ask a kid, a random kid anywhere, some Bible questions, basic Bible questions that at one time a lot of people in our culture would know. They don't know it anymore. And, in fact, <laughs> I found this little list kind of funny of uh, some actual answers from kids to Bible questions. Hey, who is Noah's wife? Uh, Joan of Arc. <laughs> uh, Lot's wife was a pillar of salt by day and a ball of fire by night. <laughs> hey, that was funny. That, that was getting a couple different stories mixed up there. Moses went to the top of Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments. Sinai? The seventh commandment is thou shalt not admit adultery. <laughs> Joshua led the Hebrews in the Battle of Jericho. <laughs> Jericho. Um, who's the epistles? The wives of the apostles. <laughs> this one's really bad or funny. A Christian should have only one wife. This is called monotony. <laughs> uh, you guys can laugh in church. It's okay. <laughs> So what are the core values that we're going to communicate to our kids? It could be worth making a list of what values you find are important so that you can be intentional about communicating those. On your outline there is a list that John Maxwell uh, gave in one of his books. He's a prolific author, did a lot on leadership, but he's talking in one book about parenting. And he says, here's 10 principles my, my parents taught me. They're all great. Responsibility and faithfulness, stewardship, determination, potential, relationships, work ethic, attitude, honesty, generosity, dependence on God. That's a good list. We could add to it, could modify it. I, I like this uh, story he tells about that first one, responsibility and faithfulness. He says, you know, my father actually had a, a strategy. He had a system to teach me responsibility, and it was chores. <laughs> Anybody do chores when you're growing up? Anybody have chores for your kids? So he said, here's how it worked in our house. We tried to do something fun as a family every Saturday. And John's a lot older than me. I met him one time. He's a cool guy. But when he was growing up as a little kid, they didn't have screen time. You know, he had to go outside to have fun. And so he said, uh, we looked forward to Saturday at noon because we would always do something fun as a family. And this particular week, we were, we were all excited and counting down to Saturday at noon because mom was making a big picnic, which included fried chicken, and we were going to the lake, and we were going to swim all afternoon. And I was so excited. But my dad gave me a chore. He said, I want you to clean the basement. And there, I didn't like anything about that, he, uh, Johnny said, because I, I don't like work. I like fun. I don't like 
I like to be outside and I like to be around people. So going into the dark basement by myself and cleaning just, just didn't sound good. So I kept putting it off and putting it off. And finally forgot about it, frankly, during the middle of the week. But then I remembered about five minutes before noon on Saturday. And I thought, oh, I didn't do it. So maybe we'll go to the lake and I'll, when we get back, I'll just sneak down there and tidy up. So he got his towel under his arm and was walking out to the car when dad said, Johnny, let's go check out how you did in the basement. And so his shoulders kind of sagged and his head kind of dropped and he followed dad reluctantly down the stairs into the basement. And dad started looking around and he said, hmm, there's all those tools I asked you to put away. They're still out. Uh, there's all that trash I asked you to throw away. Uh, there's all those... Uh, Sheets that I ask you to tear up for rags. And as I look around, it's, it looks like you didn't really do anything, did you? And Johnny just kind of dropped his head. And so he said, I never, I'll never forget what happened. My dad dropped to one knee and looked me right in the eye. And he said, Johnny, you didn't do it, did you? And I started crying. And I had to confess, no. And he said, Johnny, I want you to learn a lesson. He said, I love you. And I really I was looking forward to spending time with you at the lake today. But you're not going to be able to go to the lake because you didn't do your chores, so you're going to have to stay here and do the, your chores while we go. And I hope this doesn't happen again because I'd rather, really rather have you with us. But I need you to understand this because I want you to learn responsibility. Do you understand, son? Johnny shook his head. And he said, I'll never forget watching the car go out of the driveway and my sister sticking out her tongue. <laughs> and I'll never forget the lesson because it never happened again. And the fact that my dad was willing to parent that way helped to make me the person that I am today. That's a good story. And that's a good gift to give a kid. Because it's not very popular today, I realize that. And I realize that it takes works and it takes intentionality and it takes discipline to bring out the best in our kids. But too often, people do not discipline their kids or hold them accountable because they think it's more loving to let them have what they want. But the opposite is true. Check out this verse. Hebrews 12, 6 says, the Lord disciplines those he doesn't like. Is that what it says? <laughs> the Lord disciplines those he's mad at. No. It says the Lord disciplines those, say it with me, whom he loves. Now this is how God deals with his children and it's a model for how he wants us to deal with our children. It's a loving thing to discipline. Ephesians 6 verse 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. You see, a lot of us men, we have a tendency, a temptation, if we're not careful, to be harsh, to be overbearing in the way we talk or communicate to our kids. We think this is the way to show authority. But it, it's possible to be gentle and loving and kind with our tone while we're still firm with our discipline. Fathers, do not pr provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in, notice two things, in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. It's our re responsibility as parents to instruct them in the Lord. That's where it begins, in the home, the primary place. Look at other believers and the church family as your partners, but the primary responsibility is in the home. And discipline is not only how we show love, and it is also how we prepare them for a successful future. We've got to be thinking long term in, in our parenting, not just today. Proverbs 19, 18 says, discipline your children for in that there is hope. No guarantees, but there's hope, okay? Do not be a willing party to their death or their demise or their destruction, okay? Discipline your children while they're young enough to obey. And if you don't do that, you're actually helping set them up for destruction. That's what God's word says. And that's obviously not very loving. Now, it's important to understand the difference between punishment and discipline. Think about this for a minute. What's the difference? By the way, the Bible never says God punishes his children. It doesn't ever say that. He disciplines, and there's a difference. There's a chart in your handout, and we'll, I think we'll put it on the screen here as well. It talks about the difference between punishment and discipline. Purpose, focus, motivation, and result. First, the purpose of punishment is to inflict penalty. You did this bad, now you're going to get it. Discipline is to promote growth. It's about the future. In fact, I think that story I told you about how John Maxwell's dad dealt with him is a perfect example of 
dis- discipline rather than punishment. Discipline is focused on the past. This, uh, excuse me, punishment is focused on the past. It's all about what you did wrong rather than what you're going to learn and how you're going to grow. Discipline is uh, focused on the future and promotes growth. The motivation is different. Many times punishment is, is, is out of anger. I think we, if any of us who have been parents, we'd all admit there's times where a button gets pushed and we just kind of overreacted or reacted in an angry way rather than a calm way. And we, it would have been so much more productive to wait till we could get past the anger so that we could really communicate love. Um, you know, I, I, I uh, got a few spankings growing up, I'll admit it. Um, not too many, but I, I, I don't know if I deserved them, but probably did. Because um, I, lo- I had loving parents and they were fair. But I, I, thankfully, my dad, when he gave me a spanking a few times, he never did it out of anger. He wasn't perfect, no one is, but, but I never resented him for it. I never felt like it was, um, you know, just an angry fit of rage. And, and so I really appreciate that and have tried to incorporate that in my parenting because discipline comes, the motivation is love. And then the di- results can be very different. Uh, fear, guilt, and anger from punishment, security, and growth from discipline. Uh, there's, when you think about fear, there's a healthy fear and an unhealthy fear. And this is true in our relationship with God. The text we read talked about the fear of the Lord. That that's a good thing to pass on to our kids. The fear of the Lord. What does that mean? Well, that means respect for him. That's healthy. Doesn't mean we shake in our boots when we think about God and we're afraid of him. That's unhealthy. And the same goes with our kids. They should have a healthy fear, which is respect. If they just blow you off every time you ask them to do something, they don't respect you. On the other hand... They shouldn't be afraid of you and just obeying because they're scared. That's unhealthy fear. And if that's happening, that's a clue that you're leaning more towards punishment than discipline in your approach. Look at this verse. It's interesting in this context. 1 John 4, 18 says, There is no fear in love because perfect love drives out all fear. Because fear involves, what's the next word? Punishment. Punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. Now, let's be honest. This goes against society, where the basic message that is communicated today is let kids do whatever they want. I mean, that's the way they're going to find their way and grow up. Just let them be who they're going to be and just just let them do what they want. That's the opposite of what the Bible says. And because of that, if you're a responsible parent who responsibly disciplines in in a loving way. Nevertheless, you're going to have your kids probably looking around at other parents who parent different from you, and they're going to say, you are me. No fair. You're laughing about that. (laughs) You're you're looking at mom and laughing. You're me. Hey, if they say that, wear it as a badge of honor. Okay? (laughs) Because someday they're going to thank you for it. And you're looking at the future, not just right here if you're a good parent, right? I found this uh, little column that I thought was really good. And it's called The Meanest Mother in the World. She says, as a child, I had the meanest mother in the world. She was really mean. When other kids ate lollipops for breakfast, she made me eat cornflakes, eggs, and toast. When others had soft drinks and lollipops for lunch, I had to eat a sandwich. My mother insisted on knowing where I was at all times. You'd think I was on a chain gang. She had to know who my friends were and what I was doing. She insisted that if I said I'd be gone for an hour, that I'd be gone for an hour or less. She was really mean. I'm ashamed to admit that she actually had the nerve to break the child labor law. She made me work. I had to wash dishes, make beds, learn to cook, and all sorts of cruel things. I believe she lay awake at night thinking up mean things to do to me. She was always insisting that I tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. By the time I was a teenager, she was much wiser, and my life became even more unbearable. She embarrassed me immensely by making my friends come to the door to get me, none of this tooting the horn of the car. While my friends were dating at 12 or 13, my old-fashioned mother refused to let me date until I was 16. My mother was a complete failure as a mother. I was never arrested. I was never fired from a job. I never had my character questioned. And whom do I have to blame for the terrible way I turned out? 
You guessed it, my mom. Look at all the things I missed. I never took part in a riot or a demonstration or got chased by the police or did a million and one things that my friends did. She grew me up to be God-fearing, educated, honest adult. Using this as a background, I tried to raise my children. I stood a little taller and was filled with pride when my children called me mean. And to this day, I thank God that he gave me the meanest mother in the world. <laughs> That's pretty good, wouldn't you say? You know what? Discipline isn't popular, but it is a gift to our children. The second principle I want you to see from the text is variety. Let's think of that as strategic instruction. That is varying our approach with our children. How many of you have more than one kid? Let's see your hands. Lots of you do. And if they both had the same parents, that means they are exactly the same, right? When they come out, they're exactly the same. No? <laughs> Doesn't quite work that way, does it? They never come out the same. The first one might come out with a halo. And within 10 minutes, how can I serve you, mommy and dad? Can I clean up? Can I do some homework? And then the second one is born. Has a leather jacket and a cigar. And says, hey, my name's Beelzebub. <laughs> and you're like, oh my, what am I going to do with this one? <laughs> None of them are the same. And that's why we've got to use variety and creativity in our approach, strategic instruction. Let's be honest, this is um, something that's going to take some work and some thoughtfulness. Deuteronomy 6, verse 6 and 7 says, And these words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them how? Diligently. Underline that. Circle that. Diligently. We've got to study every one of our children and be diligent and, and in fact, creative in the way we teach them if we're going to be effective. Now, there's all sorts of work that's been done and research on personality types. You've probably read books and articles and taken personality profiles and all that. And so there's so much that we can learn about different styles. God's created us all different. Here's one example in your outline. I've got um, a little chart that shows four different learning styles. And the first uh, is innovative. Um, those uh, who are more feeling-oriented in the way that they live and learn. Uh, it reminds me of a biblical character named Barnabas in the New Testament. His name means son of encouragement, and that's how he lived. He was always trying to be a reconciler and bring people together. And he was a people person. He loved people. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's hard not to like Barnabas when you read about him. And so these, these are people persons. They like hugs, and they like groups. They like, they'll go to a sem you go to a seminar, and you don't know a soul there. And in the middle of the, the presentation, they say, okay, we're going to break up for 20 minutes in small groups now to discuss this. And these type of people say, yeah. And they start hugging everybody in their group. You know, the rest of the learning styles are like, are you kidding me? I don't want to pool ignorance with these people for 20 minutes. I'll, I'll be back. I'm out of here. <laughs> but the, the innovative feeling learners, they're, they're all into it, you know. They love to talk, 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 talk about everything all the time, okay. That's one style. And probably if we did a survey here, it would be about 25, 25, 25, 25 percent because we're, we're, it, that's kind of how it falls out. We're, we are all wired different in the way we learn. The second is analytical learner, analytic. And so uh, they learn in two ways, watching and listening. Happiness is a full notebook. Some of you analytical learners, man, you've already got tons of notes. You're just going after it. It's awesome. They want to know what the experts think. And you know what drives them crazy? If I, I got this outline with all these blanks on it, if I forgot one and left a blank, you're going to be talking to me afterwards. First thing, I'm going to be standing in line. What was that one I missed? The good news is I'm an analytical learner, so it won't happen probably. But if it does, yeah, these, these are the learners that, that they read books, not just buy them. And I think this biblical dude, Ezra, was one of these kind of, the very top of your outline, it says Ezra 17, Ezra set his heart to study the law of the Lord, to practice it, and to teach it. So he was a studier. He, he was one of these analytical type learners. And by the way, uh, analytical learners often did very well in school. And it's not because they're smarter. It's because studies show that a lot of schools are designed by uh, analytic learners for analytic learners. 
And so there's some who didn't do as well in school, not because you're not bright, but because you never maybe got taught according to your learning style. Kind of an interesting thought there as you think about parenting. A third style is common sense learner. I think of the biblical character Thomas, one of Jesus' disciples, who we sometimes call him Doubting Thomas because he wasn't there when all the other disciples saw Jesus alive after the resurrection. And they were like, we believe. And he was like, not me. I got to ask some questions. I got to see them first. I got to talk. I got, I got questions. Analy- or these common sense learners are always asking questions. They're very curious, and that's how they learn. They have to ask questions to learn. And if you're one of those, you've probably already been tempted to ask a question a few times in this message. Wait till afterwards. Thank you. But you can come talk to me. And then there's the dynamic learner, active. I think of Peter, one of Jesus' disciples. He, he, Jesus is walking on the water, and everybody else is like, hey, look what Jesus is doing. And Peter's like, me too. Can I walk on the water? These, these type of folks, they learn by doing. Other people learn by thinking and watching and listening and feeling. But, but these folks, they learn by doing something. And, and so if you're one of those folks, you're listening to this message and you're saying, let's get to the application and go do something. I'm ready. <laughs> you know you're one of these kind of learners if you get a box from Amazon and it's something you have to put together and the first thing you do is open it up and throw the instructions away. <laughs> All right? That means you're this kind of a learner or you're a man. <laughs> um, I'll have to confess there's been a few times I had to dig in the trash to get them back out before the project was over. <laughs> uh, my wife's father was over a couple days ago to help us put some new lights in the um, restroom and uh, we open up the box and I pulled out the direction I said you want these he goes no that's for sissies (laughs) that's the kind of learner he is he knows how to do it so the point is we're all wired differently It's not good or bad. It's just the way God created us all differently. And so we've got to adapt our strategy and tailor it to our different kids. Some are going to be better at conversations. Some are going to be better at reading. Some are going to have to figure some things out for themselves. And so to adapt and to do strategic instruction takes diligence. It takes creativity. It takes variety to communicate lasting values. A third principle from our passage is vision. Are you a visionary parent, a visionary leader? If so, you're going to be more likely to have a high resistance to discouragement because of focusing on the vision. Deuteronomy 6 verse 2, here's the reason for obeying the Lord. So that Your children, you, your children, and their children. This is vision. This is long-term thinking. You, your children, their children, may, after them, may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. That's a great vision, leaving a legacy for your children and their children and following the Lord and enjoying life. Now, if you look around and you look at history and you look at society, um, you, you notice very quickly that those who have the most influence over others and those who end up uh, leaving the, making the most impact on others are generally people of vision, visionary type people. They have a vision for the future and that helps them to resist discouragement. Now, some of us are more naturally wired that way and some of us are not. But all of us can consciously choose where we focus. And that's really what vision is. It's choosing where you focus. So if if you like taking notes, write these down. Three marks of a visionary. Number one, that focus on the future, not the past. The text tells us to think about the future. In the future when your son comes to ask you, what are you going to tell him? Well, it's future oriented. And, And Uh, When we think about passing on values to our children, you can't change the past, but you can change the future. So focus there. Second, focus on potential rather than problems. You know, I think we would all agree quickly that positive reinforcement is more effective than negative reinforcement. But it's a temptation for us to sometimes just, just continue to focus on the past and on the problems rather than on what can be the potential. 
And we're going to come back to this next week when we talk about the characteristic of competence. You know, our, our kids need to know what they're good at and their spiritual gifts and how they, how they can uh, lean in to what they're good at. Focus on potentials. And third, focus on enjoying life rather than enduring life. Did you notice that in the text? Following God's plan for your life is not about just gritting it out and enduring life, but enjoying life to the fullest. That's God's goal for you. And he says, if you follow my word and teach it to your kids and your grandkids, the text says, one of the benefits is that you will enjoy life, enjoy a long life. In other words, bring the atmosphere of heaven into your home. Now, when we think about what is most important to communicate to our kids in passing on values? We can make a long, long list, but as I, as I think about condensing to just three, these are three vital messages that are contrary to what culture is screaming, that I so much want my kids and, and all the kids that I have a, an opportunity to impact to get. First of all, we want the next generation to realize the essence of Christianity is a relationship with God. Now you say, duh, everybody knows that. No, everybody does not know that. Too many kids and adults, I know because I, of how I grew up, they got turned off to religion because they thought following God was all about lists of do's and don'ts and rights and wrongs and rituals and routines and all of that, and they got turned off to that. They didn't think they could be good enough. And so they said, forget it. But the truth is, the gospel is not that. It's about a relationship with Jesus. It's about a relationship with the God of the universe through the Son who has reconciled those who put their faith in Him. And it's beautiful. It's attractive. It's about a friendship, not about a list of regulations, okay? And so this is so vital that our kids get this because um, it's not always the case in churches and in Christian homes. And, and over the years, I have over and over talked to our children's ministries leaders about ruthlessly evaluating the curricula, curriculum that we use here so that we don't get this moralism that's all about behavior that we're teaching our kids, but rather that we are focused on the gospel of grace in Christ Jesus and the friendship and relationship with him that we're called to and how to build that and how to grow that relationship. Okay, that is so, I got so passionate about this and I hope you are too as we think about what the next generation is gonna receive. Second, we want them to know that serving Christ is the most satisfying lifestyle. Satisfaction and fulfillment does not come from material possessions or from self-gratification. It seems like it does for a moment, but it fades. No, it comes from serving the Lord and his people. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom. He's our model. And this is what we need to not only teach our kids, but model for our kids if we, wanna, if we want them to grow healthy. By the way, you heard Pastor Hollis earlier talking about some opportunity. If you care about kids and you want to have a role in passing on values to the next generation, we have some very meaningful opportunities for you right now in Next Gen Ministry. And we would love to have you step up and be a part of the team there. One more for all of you analytic learners. <laughs> Got to make sure you get this one filled in. Living life in obedience to God's instructions leads to a God-blessed life. If you buy a new car, there's going to be an owner's manual that comes with it, probably in the glove box. You pull that out and start reading it. It is written by the manufacturer who knows the car better than anyone, right? And it is not intended to be restrictive. It's intended to help you operate your vehicle. It's not intended to make your life hard or restrict you. You're re Are you kidding me? I can only put oil in there? I want to put gas in there. Are you? No. This is helpful. Because the ones who made it know how it runs best. And I want you to think about the Bible as, yes, a love letter from God to earth, if you read it right, but also an owner's manual may, written by the manufacturer who knows how your life is going to operate best. 
So he's not trying to make your hard, life hard and restrictive by, by the principles and values that are communicated here, but he's, gonna try to, to help, he's trying to help you to live an abundant life, to enjoy life to its fullest, to live a God-blessed life. And only the creator knows how that works. I was reading recently a, an interview with a woman who had tragically lost her son at age 24 in a drowning accident. And she was asked how she could live with the loss of a child, such a, such a tragedy. And she said, honestly, I can say I have no regrets with the way I raised him. I wasn't a perfect mother, but I poured into him time, energy, and love from the moment he was born, and I have no regrets about that. And as I heard that, I thought, oh, that's the way I want to live with no regrets. Uh, I think all of us want to parent that way, to pour everything we can into the next generation during this short season that we have and, and to finish with no regrets. So that's my prayer for myself, my family. That's my prayer for you and your family. That's my prayer for this church. And listen, some of you, your kids are gone and you, you're tempted to have some regrets because of things you wish you'd have done different. We all have things we wish we would have done different. But it is never too late to start, even if your kids are grown and gone. This, the future is still ahead of you. Focus on the future, not on the past. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your love for us, for your, your counsel and instructions for us, for your grace, for your forgiveness, for your guidance, for your wisdom, for Jesus. We thank you from the bottom of our heart and we want to bring our lives as much as we can in alignment with you and pursue that, that blessed life and that close relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, we're going to sing a song of worship here called Good Grace. Aren't you thankful for God's grace? And there's one line in here that I really want you to pay attention to because some of you maybe um, get a little discouraged when you think about ways you could do better, could have done better, and, and you, you want to do best for your kids. Um, so there's a line in here that says, Take courage. Remember where your help comes from. And I hope that when you walk out of here, you will have that, those words ringing in your, 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 your ears. Take courage and remember where your help comes from.